Well, if you need help in finding errors in your code, just drop us a note. We'll try to help you. Please do that. That's what we're here for. Okay, so uh, let me continue. Last time I started looking at um, some of the work I was doing uh, with Craig and, uh, <clears throat> uh, and I'll continue this earthquake discussion, which is a pretty complicated case. And I hope it doesn't put you off. Okay, so uh, let me uh, share the screen. Can you, can people see my screen? Yes. Yeah. All right. So we were um, trying to um, tackle this problem as has been unsolved for many years, maybe forever, unfortunately, which is trying to predict reliably earthquakes, or as I think some people prefer to say, forecast earthquakes. And. <clears throat> Here we have a, um, uh, so this was the data which I introduced last time, which is a subset of the data we're looking at, but it shows the region we're looking at, Southern California, which is one of the more active places for earthquakes in the world. And um, these, f these five red regions are where there had to happen to be large earthquakes since 1990. And these blobs here are just a plot of earthquakes. Most of them are low, uh, low magnitude. Blue is around one. And there are a few yellows up at four. And there are, in the middle here, there are these reds, which are sevens in these little um, regions. So we're, we're trying to predict that. And I explain why, due to the physics, it's pretty hard to predict in that these are not continuous functions, but just uh, um, every now and then just happen. And uh, that's why, and the same techniques that get used to study earthquakes also get used to study the stock market because the stock market's also a little like earthquakes. It has violent events when, when a hedge fund goes um, bankrupt or something like that, and that causes tremendous uh, spill off uh, spillover effects uh, over the whole stock market. So we want, instead of looking at hedge funds going bankrupt, look at uh, faults uh, um, moving and causing quakes. And here is a, an example of the uh, uh, data, which uh, is actually an example of the forecast. Uh, this is, uh, this is a plot of from 1950 here up to now 2020 of the uh, uh, of the magnitude averaged over two weeks compared to with, with the forecast and the data, and it is not so bad. And in as is you'd expect in. Uh, in a machine learning problem where we are, have both um, training data and validation data. And the training data is 400 of those little, we divided that region I showed you into 2,400 sub-regions, each of which was about 11 kilometers by 11 kilometers, which is sort of a, a natural size for studying earthquakes, somewhere between 10 and 30 kilometers on a in a re, uh, for a region size. 
and um, I chose 400 of them random of the five. I found 500 which were active, active regions. I chose 400 randomly for training and 100 to be validation. And the neural net was discovered from the training data and then applied to the validation data. And so you can see the validation data is not perfectly described. And in fact, if you look at the loss on this particular um, uh, case, the uh, loss on the training data is certainly less than the loss on the validation data. This is the, um, sim the simplest model, the um, recurrent neural neck LSTM. And this is the transformer, which is actually a little better, but not much better. It's, uh, um, and it's actually it's best for, it does the training data particularly better than the LSTM, but that's what really counts is validation. As the transformer model has more parameters, you could imagine it's just curve fitting if it fits the training data better than the, if it does very well on the training data, but not so well on the validation. Anyway, that's what we're trying to predict. So let's just see what it takes to do that. Now, the first choice is what, uh, one of the choices, which I think I mentioned, is what variables to choose. <clears throat> now, let me see an example which doesn't look so good. All right, so this is, sorry, this, that's this data. Um, all right, so I did the, that's exactly the same, that's actually mathematically the same data as before, but I did not um, use magnitude. I, the magnitude is um, uh, 1 over 1.5 times log to the base 10 of the energy, where the energy is the amount of, one well, amount of stuff removed, I mean, energy released in the earthquake. And so actually when I started this problem, I thought we should use energy because uh, being a physicist by training, I believe in energy. Energy is um, conserved and, and if you take two energies, you can add them together. And when, we're going, when we do neural nets, we add things in together and multiply them to get by weights and things like that. Well, that's what you do with energy. You do not do it with a log of energy because if you, add two logs as equivalent to multiplying energies together, which is a really unphysical thing to do. However, you will get terrible answers, at least unless you change your formalism dramatically if you use energy. And here we, say, here we show um, what happens when you use um, energy to the quarter, which is even, which is really a small step from, which is, less extreme than energy, because we, we, this is a general point when you're looking at variables. If your variables are very spread out, you so see, you look at this, uh, these plots here, they're very spread out. Here is uh, the quiescent values. They're all around here, low in the plot. And every now and then we get a big spike. That's the earthquake. Uh, blue is the actual observed value. So you have these big earthquakes. And so you get a very large ratio for energy to the quarter, the ratio between quiescent and real is maybe a factor of 20. And um, of course, if we took energy, it will be 20 to the fourth times difference, which is a huge effect, 100,000. Well, if you take data where the maximum value is 100,000 times the mean, uh, you will find it tough to get good results because um, everything is dominated by the large values. And so you hardly will notice a small value. You see that this, even if there's fit here to, um, to the, uh, to this energy to the quarter, the fit in the region of the quiescent values, so where it's not so much going on, is pretty bad. The error is bouncing up and down. It's quite large compared to the value. If you compare that with what's happening here, here the uh, error is, I don't know, 20% of the value maybe in the quiescent region. Notice this is exactly the same data. This is the log magnitude. The next data is just e to the quarter. So 
it is very difficult to persuade um, the system to fit these quiescent points. Because remember, uh, we are using uh, mean square error as the loss. And so what counts is the absolute value of the loss. Well, if you have a big spike like this, this blue thing here, well, we have this error here. Well, this error here, which is 20% on the spike, which is not so bad, but it's a huge number compared to these little errors here. These errors, which are maybe 50%, uh, the errors may be 50% of the value, they contribute a tiny amount compared to this 20% error on the spike. So what happens when you get um, lots of big, lots of spikes, you're dominated by those spikes. Now, on the other hand, actually, we're most interested in the spikes. We're trying to predict the spikes. Um, and actually, there's some analogies in this study between predicting anomalies and uh, where Ch Chayu works on and um, predicting earthquakes, because we're trying to find anomalies. And so, all right, so this just tells you, I actually have not got good results yet by using energy to the quarter. And uh, I am still working on trying to use that. But if we now, if we make them, we try to learn something about, about um, how to do data analysis. When you take your data, um, at least in principle, you're allowed to replace your data by any function of that data. Now, the simplest thing to do is, which is uh, well, at least I do automatically, is to take all the data, reduce it so that the maximum value is one and the minimum value is minus one, or in this case here where everything is positive, the minimum value is zero and the maximum is one. Well, that's a simple linear transformation. It doesn't really affect the data much. However, there's no reason to restrict yourself to linear transformations at least in principle. And so you can do things like take the square root of the data, the quarter root of the data, or the log of the data. Or you can take the data squared. And when you do that type of manipulation, you will find that if you raise data to a par, if the par is greater than one, you enhance anomalies. If the par is less than one, you reduce anomalies. Um, and that's what you see here. Here, I mean, the log is essentially the zeroth power, at least all near the zeroth power, and uh, in, qualitatively. And it has much smoother behavior than either the quarter. And so, although therefore, so when we added another project with the biologists, <coughs> and there, when we were solving differential equations, <coughs> I wanted to find a neural net to predict the solution of the differential equation. We actually did use the log of the prediction as the thing to look at for reasons like this. But unless you, if you, unless you take the log, you get too big a variation in the numbers. It doesn't have to be, in that case, there weren't these extreme spikes, but the actual value had just varied too much. Now you can change the LOX function because this is, uh, you could actually change the loss to be the fractional loss or the like uh, energy minus value or squared over value squared rather than energy minus value or squared. Uh, sorry, prediction minus value or squared. So there are all sorts of things you can do and those are actually things that should be in your arsenal as a data scientist. You need to be able to choose the right variables and the right loss function. And there was no, of course, right answer, but there are some relatively obvious criteria you should use. And um, in the case of deep learning, it's actually quite subtle because these variables you we have, which uh, appear in both the input and the output, because we're feeding into the, the time series, which are the previous values, and we're predicting the final values. And one thing on my list to try, which I've actually just started to try, is using energy to the quarter in the input data, but not in the output data. Because the trouble with it in the output data, it produces these anomalous errors, which we see here. But as far as I know, there is no theorems 
there's just folklore and common sense. The common sense is that the poor old neural net ain't going to be able to describe such spiky data very well. And you better help it by, by we could even try ETH the one eight. That will take that factor of 20 between peak to, to, to quiescent to the square root of 20, which is um, not nearly as bad, that's four. So there are all sorts of choices you can make. We can take the log goes to e to the one eighth. That would be a one thing on one's list of choices to make. So, all right. So this just points out that um, when you're doing these problems, as Eve will say, running the job, do people wax eloquent about how long these computer jobs run. However, it's these initial analyses that are possibly even more important. And those don't use a lot of computer time, but they do need a lot of thought. Um, but of course, I did actually to convince myself that ETH of the quarter was not clearly a good idea, or at least done naively. I did run several computer jobs, which took quite a lot of time. Uh, because it's uh, it's not entirely obvious whether the uh, whether the neural net could fit these spiky data, and it appears from this it can't. All right, so this is a, a more a precise statement of what we actually did. So if we look at the input data, we have the most important data is the magnitude, because the magnitude is what measures the actual earthquake. And as I said, the magnitude is um, 1 over 1.5 log to the base 10 of the energy. So and when we and when the other important point is we're binning the data, so we're adding several earthquakes together. Because in two weeks, which is our bin size in time, uh, um, or even just in 11 kilometer squares, that can have thousands of quakes in, in that one region. And if there was an earthquake at that time, and we looked at all possible magnitudes, you might get a thousand quakes in the bin. So. Well, we better not add them up because if each of those quakes is magnitude one, namely it was trivial, a thousand times one is a thousand. And it is, we don't really want to make it look like a, an event of magnitude of a thousand. So we use what I call the log energy, which is we take all the magnitudes, we raise them, we take the magnitudes, find the energy, sum the energy, and then take the log. So it converts it back to a magnitude. Because the magnitude, so this is actually a little subtle. That's not what you might have thought about if you took the data as it came. Um, so anyway, all these results using log energy. When I write magnitude, it's really the log energy. And that's important, as I say, for adding different quakes in the same bin. Now, as well as the energy in the bin, we have the depth. How do we do the depth? Well, for the depth, we use a related idea. We take every depth, multiply it by its energy, and divide by the sum of the energy. So we get energy weighted depths. So if there's one giant earthquake at a certain depth and lots of small earthquakes, the results will be dominated by the giant earthquakes. I should say that the log of the energy because e to the 10 to the 1.5 times m is such a strong power of m. And if we have an m of seven and an m of three, well, they're gonna differ by this, um, uh, a factor of a million in this sum. Uh, this this uh, energy, this um, log energy is actually very similar to taking the maximum magnitude. So that's just another strategy. When you have a set of values, you can just take its maximum. And if those values are varying strongly like they are here, I say it's equivalent to the log energy of maximum, but pretty similar. However, there was one thing we just added, and that's counting the number of earthquakes. Although that does give a pretty spiky function, because you can I say, if you have a big earthquake, there are thousands of small earthquakes nearby it. So I made the decision there to feed in this multiplicity of uh, earthquakes, but not to predict it. Because that prediction will have the same problem we saw for e to the one quarter, a huge variation between maximum and quiescent value. Anyway, all of this, you know, I've just spent uh, 
10 minutes on it or something or five minutes, you have to make all these decisions before you start the analysis. At this point, then you need to understand the type of logic. What so was the logic that went into this? The logic is, well, we, um, we're trying to get data which stands a chance of being described, which means it better be smooth in some fashion. And it better, because we have activation functions which care about the number one, I better not be, uh, better be normalized properly so it lies at the, the result values are of order unity. So, so my general computer program I use for this problem, it has the choice for every variable. You can take an arbitrary par and then, well, then you take the arbitrary, you specify the par and then you normalize it. it uh, the program automatically normalizes it between minus one and one. All right, so that's that. I already showed this graph. This just points out a little more precisely the difference between um, here we have energy to the quarter, energy to the half, energy average magnitude, and summed magnitude um, as a function of, um, of uh, time from 1950 to 2020. But uh, although this is quite a nice plot showing the huge, which doesn't clearly show the huge difference between either the half square root, which is here, and uh, the uh, this magnitude, which is here, the, um, uh, it, we already saw that. So, but this is just the type of things we look at before we start the analysis. Now, one of the very hardest problems is how you decide whether you've got a good answer. That's because what do, what do people care about? What they really care about is the house going to be knocked down or the value decreased by a large earthquake. I don't think they mind too much about an earthquake of size even five, which just rattles the house a bit and nothing much happens. But they care about large earthquakes and they don't really care whether, whether it would be nice to predict tomorrow's earthquake. But they really want to know over the next five to 10 years, is there gonna be an earthquake? And so we have to find some, so, but anyway, quite, so we, that's why in the predictions I look at the, I don't go up to five or 10 years, I go up to four years and how far ahead I predict. But then we want to have some measure of performance. And there was these two people, Nash and Sutcliffe, which came up with a measure of performance for these time series problems, which seems to me um, pretty useful, which other people may wish to use for other problems. It is actually mainly used in hydrology. That's where I discovered it. But it's a, it's a mathematically um, well-defined object. The Nash, so-called Nash Sutcliffe efficiency, I'm not quite certain why it's an efficiency. It says how good the model is it compares the standard deviation of the, uh, the, the mean square error of the, of the um, prediction compared to the natural mean squared error of the data. So this is the prediction minus the mean of the, minus the observed, we summing over all time values, prediction minus um, observed over, observed minus the mean of the observed. So actually what I should have drawn it the opposite way. Well, this is Wikipedia. I just cut and pasted this from. But um, you can, it really tells you, are you doing any better in your model than just predicting the mean? And um, so this is, that's the Nash Sutcliffe efficiency. And I use that to just summarize the value of my fit and I have some much later on some values of the Nash Sutcliffe efficiency. But even choosing this, I'm not, is not so trivial because I don't think it's agreed as the right uh, in other areas other than hydrology. It dominates in the area of hydrology. But I don't see why it's not a generally useful concept. And actually, in compared to, instead of the NSE, which lies between minus infinity and one. Uh, we choose the normalized NSE called NNSE, which is one over two minus uh, um, NSE, which lies between naught and one. 
and you want to try and to find values bigger than a half because um, if you have um, NSC of zero says that the mean of the of the data is as good as the model. So you really want to have your NSC bigger than zero, which is your normalized NSC, which lies between naught and one, bigger than a half. All right, so that's another little bat, little arrow to put in your quiver when you start to do data analysis. All right, the next thing is faults. Well, when I started this problem a year and a half ago or something, unfortunately now, uh, but I've only been working on it uh, more like a year, um, I assume faults are very important because earthquakes lie on faults and faults are by definition, the defects in the, in the crust, which are slipping. So you have uh, this fault and th these faults are where the, where the uh, continents below you are slipping to each, between each other. And you typically have earthquakes correlated along faults. The trouble is, in that region of Southern California, there are lots of faults, hundreds of faults. And there's a nice USGS uh, book of faults. And my friend John Rundle, who I asked for advice, says, well, those are just some of the faults. Uh, there are always new faults being discovered. So we didn't quite see how to use faults, but we are sort of superficially using them. We use the world's catalog of faults and we managed to divide Southern California into fault families. So these 20 are so fault family number 20, and there are a lot of faults uh, seemingly together here. Here's fault family three, fault family 14, fault family zero, they're just, and here we have large, this is where there's hardly anything going on. Fault family 31 is really lack of fault family 31, there's nothing going on in that region. So we ended up with uh, 30, 36 fault regions. And we classified every earthquake by which of these regions is ran, ran, we, we um, it laid in. And we use that as a static variable which um, we uh, define the data with. So a given earthquake would have a, a time, well, which is just specified by time and space, which is specified which bin they live in, a date, so, I mean, uh, and um, it would also have a fault number. All right. So when I started, I thought we were going to be able to use so-called graph neural nets because faults look uh, essentially faults by linking earthquakes together or forming a graph between earthquakes. And graph neural nets have been applied to a related problem that of um, traffic or running on roads. And you can think of roads as a like faults. Roads are uh, lines which uh, join things together and uh, a given road, anything on a given road is connected to each other. Um, so I originally thought we would use the graph neural net method, but when I looked at the data, or we looked at the data, we didn't see that that was terribly useful because the data isn't tremendously correlated on a fine, on a clear fashion with faults. There are, there are faults, but there's so many faults and, the, and a given eruption on a given fault happens at various times that they did not seem to have a strong structure. But I, we may be wrong, um, but we, the moment we are doing a rather modest use of faults. Although I spent us a long time finding those families. I remember, I think I spent a couple of weeks doing it and I'm disappointed that we couldn't um, we couldn't do anything better than we did. I should say that the, I labeled them by not the 35, but um, really you would like to retain some um, spatial information because um, faults that are near each other are actually related because if faults join, you can actually get quakes propagated at that join. So I use space filling curves to, to rotate, replace the number north to 35 by the number of the curve that went through those points. 
And there are lots of space filling curves. So I actually ended up with four, four different fault labelings corresponding to four different space filling curves. Um, well, I'd already be doing machine learning with my friend John Randall, not deep learning, just machine learning using principal component analysis and related ideas. And we have a paper here, which I've given you the uh, DOI for. Um, and it actually was the, it actually has very similar basic ideas. It has a uh, spatial subregions in this particular paper. They're um, uh, three times as big on the side as in our paper. And they use a four week, not a two week basic interval. One idea we copied directly from this previous work was by looking at this um, John Randall's choice of magnitudes greater than 3.29. So we not only looked at the total count of quakes, we looked at the count of quakes with magnitude greater than 3.29. And actually that's how we chose the 500 regions. We chose those regions so that they uh, had a significant number of magnitude greater than 3.29 um, quakes in them. <clears throat> we not only that, I should say, not just in them or in their nearby, because these things are spatially uh, connected, uh, we requ I required that they be um, either had great, I looked at the counts both in the, in, the, um, in the region and also in the neighboring regions. So um, actually we, I required bigger than at least five quakes in the region or 24 quakes in the, in the nine regions near, near that, including that region. Um, in, 2D, you have nine in a nearest neighbor cluster. All right, but all of this is already, this, you see why it took us a year and a half to do this. All this is, all this, this is data engineering, but this is not data engineering, which takes a huge amount of time. It's because adding up, doing a Q, adding up number of counts is not that time consuming, but this data engineering takes a lot of human time. And here I've described, so we have, we have, I say for a long time, I didn't know how to do validation because the way um, TensorFlow defaults validation doesn't really work as far as I can see for time series. Because TensorFlow chooses random, a random set of, uh, you hand it some things, it chooses a random subset to be the validation. But that doesn't work because that random subset is the, the, in this particular data set that the, there's correlations between the sequences because you feed in a different a sequence for every, um, well, in our case of length 13, which is a half a year set of data, but we have overlapping sequences. So these sequences are, 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 are correlated. And so if you take the TensorFlow choice, you'll get dubious answers because <laughs> the validation data is correlated with the training data and the neural net in fitting the training data will almost automatically fit the validation data. So we solved that problem by using totally different spatial locations. So we took our 500 spatial regions and we shoved aside 100 of them and say, you're the validation region. And we took the other 400 as the training. There's still some slight correlations because due, due to um, nearest neighbor structure. I mean, if there's a giant earthquake in the, in the training sample or, or even the validation, but I should say these training and validation, they can each have big, big earthquakes in them. But if there's a large earthquake in the validation set, it will spill over possibly to the training set because the validation and training data uh, uh, they're just chosen randomly in that group of 500, then a validation region will be surrounded and will have many training regions next to it. But it's still not a huge correlation. And so I, I don't know how often that particular problem exists, but it is a non-trivial problem. Um, Another thing that's important to do, at least for the transformer network, it doesn't matter for LSTM as far as I know, is you need to make certain you mask out the future. 
because in the transformer network, you're looking for patterns. Now, if your job was, let's do the world's best description of the um, earthquake data, which is actually a problem of some, I mean, not at least related problems, making the best possible uh, model for a given set of data is a non-trivial thing and useful thing to do. But it's uh, going to bias your validation because you're going to learn from the future. So the validation will not be sound. It's, and so you, you say you veto the future. And that reduces the amount of data you have by half. Uh, because in general, uh, if you have two points, one of them is uh, randomly distributed in the time regions so half the time one of them is later than the other one um, so that that's quite important to do otherwise so it points out here you, you can get the wrong biased answers very easily here um, and you need to be a little careful what job you're trying to do um, namely if I wanted to um, make predictions way into the future from the current data, I'm not certain that you would use a validation set. You might try, and you might not certainly would mask out the future times. I think you might want to get the best possible description of the current data and do that without masking and um, without a validation set, because you certainly want to predict as well as possible an earthquake in the validation area where you're not going to do as well otherwise. So depending on that, but if we want to test this as a valid method, we better have an unbiased validation set and unbiased predictions. So that's what we have here. And any results I have, have those choices made. But they say, it's not what I would use if I wanted to decide but to buy a house in Southern California. I would probably take a different set of data, which was solely aimed at predicting the future I didn't know and couldn't care less about whether I had a biased prediction of the current data. So this actually um, shows these uh, quite prettily, the, uh, these 500 regions. So here we have the, uh, uh, here we have on the, uh, we have the 2,400 locations, each of these squares is, uh, one of those locations, they run from 30 to, uh, latitude 32 to 36 and longitude minus 120 to minus 114. And um, Los Angeles is in the middle there with the Pacific Ocean on the bottom left and the desert to the top right. And the gray and black things are the points we didn't choose. Uh, the, the green are the validation set and the red are the training set. And there's some, there are 20 numbers here and these are the 20 top earthquakes in the time period 1950 to 2020. And they all are either in the blue or red and there's one 17 which is just displaced by one. And probably that's as, probably it was actually pretty near the neighboring uh, pink regions which are next to 17. 17 is down, I don't, 17 is down here. That's the only one that's not in a major earthquake, which is not in here, but we will get all the quakes here. And 17, I think it's obviously associated with 10. All right, so this shows that you know, our data is pretty correlated. There's a huge bunch of data in this San Andreas fault type region here and very little data here in the actual Los Angeles Basin. Um, so that's the data used. And that, that already took me nine months to do because I didn't start off with this. I only switched to using these locations maybe three months ago. And that was because of the other work I was doing with John Rundle on a different problem, which uh, uh, also had the same problem. If you separate this, if you take all these uh, gray and dark points which don't have much going on, they tend to gain distort the fit. That's another thing you have to worry about. You want to avoid distorting the fit. 
and even biasing the fit. If you have lots of zero entries and you're predicting zero to be zero, that may not be uh, the wisest thing. Uh, they may, that may produce biases which are irrelevant because you don't really want to predict zero when there's zero. You want to predict magnitude seven when there have been magnitude three. That's the goal. And so you, you really don't want to confuse with, um, with uh, other data. But, and we found that issue that the gray areas where we fed them in, they tended to come out non-zero and their contribution to the mean square error was non-trivial when added over all of them, because there are lots of these rather modest sized earthquake regions. All right, so um, well, this probably, uh, I've said effectively this, we have 0.1 by 0.1 latitude, longitude degree subregions, that's 11 kilometers square. Um, the actual data as processed uh, is binned in daily. So the Python program reads in daily data. You then choose um, what the interval you actually want. And so with Rundle, I chose 28 days, or he chose 28 days. And in this analysis, we chose 14 days. Uh, I don't think there's much difference between 14 and 28. They show the, the scale of things that happen. This says that uh, the region is quite, the, the basic uh, time delay is two to four weeks. That's not so big. But the sequence, which is a length 13, is half a year. Or it, if we chose a four week, uh, 13, four week samples, it would be a year. So we have a sample size, which we're looking at as a correlated set, which is half to one year, and the subregion size of two weeks. And um, I've already pointed out, these are not independent sequences. This is a feature of these types of time series and this uh, particular way I'm looking at them in terms of you divide them into equally spaced intervals, and then you join the intervals into uh, intervals of a certain length. Um, then any given point probably occurs here in 13 different sequences. So uh, you have huge correlations between the sequences. Um, and then what you, so you take these sequences, you associate with every sequence, the input data, which is calculated every two weeks. And you have to, we will discuss later what the input data is. And then at the end of the 13 weeks, they make a prediction. So every sequence, which is 13 uh, time values has a, a prediction and every time value has a property. Um, now, this is an important point that will impact everybody doing this type of work. Uh, maybe I actually, if you're a sophisticated machine learning person, you may know how to solve the missing data problem, but um, I don't know how to solve the missing data problem. So I avoid having missing data. Um, when that's a big speed, let me be precise. I avoid having missing data in the input. Remember, we have two types of data, the input data and the output, the predicted data. They're related because we're trying to use the previous earthquakes to predict future earthquakes. So in that sense, the input and output are the same type of data, but if we, we were going to feed this, uh, feed all this uh, input data into the into the transformer or um, the current neural net, well, I don't know how to, I mean, I really don't want any missing data there because then you're multiplying by, you do have to do something else, but I don't want to interpolate earthquakes because earthquakes are not very smooth. So I don't like that. So. That meant, uh, well, now as I'm, as I have the list of earthquakes and I'm calculating every single bin, I, ha I have no missing data on the time for each time value. However, as one of the properties I'm going to have is the, uh, the log energy for the previous year. So I'm going to take every time value and tell you the log energy for the previous year. Well, then I would have missing data near the beginning if I chose every, every possible time sequence. So I throw away the first year's worth of um, information in terms of making sequences, start calculating sequences, 
Then as I have this secret reservoir of one year's extra data, I, um, I can calculate the one year, previous one year's worth, I mean, actually six months and three months and so on. Um, now, let's come to the end of the region. So I'm predicting the future. So in the training data, I need to tell you what the future is. And I pointed out, we really want to predict the future into the, significantly into the future. When we started this data, this analysis, we just took a bin and predicted the next bin. But that is not, so that's actually probably pretty, that one of the harder problems. It's probably much easier to say, take the current data, predict the chance of something happening in a long time period afterwards. <coughs> because um, the exact time of the earthquake is pretty uncertain. Whether there will be an earthquake in the next five years is a, probably an easier thing to predict. So even that's not been proven, I think, but it's at least plausible. Um, so we need to predict not just the following time window, the next two weeks, we want to predict the next few years. And I made the choice of going up to four years in the future. So we did. Uh, so now if you look at that and you get near and then you take the input data from 1916 onwards, 2016 onwards, it will not have the training data for four years in advance. So that data is missing, but that data is only missing on predictions. And you're allowed to have missing predicted data. Um, because the prediction, the loss function is a sum over prediction of the predictive value minus the observed value all squared over all predictions. Well, if you have missing predictions, it's not a problem. You just drop it from the loss function. So that just meant that um, when I took the four year data, the uh, sequences which ended, which ended between 19, uh, 1951, I dropped, it started in 1950, so I dropped the first year. So sequences from 1951 through um, 2019, 2020 had two week predictions. Sequences from 1951 through 2016 had four year predictions. So we just had a fraction of the later data had no four year training data predictions, but it didn't cause any trouble, we just dropped it. If we'd had missing input their predictions, we couldn't have been able to multiply the matrices together and we could not have done anything. And mathematically or in Python, I used the nifty NAND symbol to flag, um, to flag missing data. I just set the prediction to be NAND. And then Python, when it calculated the loss function, checked for NAND, if there was a NAND, it just dropped the point from its uh, least square sum. Well, here's this list of earthquakes, which I showed you there were 20 earthquakes. And here is just what they are. And um, this data is fed in mainly to help the plot. So that when you look at the plots, you can see which the real earthquakes. Of significance and these were these are magnitude. Well, 5.9 is the uh, is the smallest, and the biggest is 7.5. Um, what is this? So, well, this is actually a plot of the Rundle variable, the number of quakes with magnitude greater than 3.29. You remember the previous plot I had, which was quakes. Well, this is the number greater than 3.29, and it is pretty sparse. There are very few of these, these ones with magnitudes greater than 3.29. And um, you can see again, the major earthquakes plotted, they're all typically in regions where there are magnitudes quakes bigger than 3.29. And in my slightly extended thing where I include nearest neighbor points as well, then you get a non-trivial you, you get the 500 uh, locations. So that's the Randall variable, pretty, uh, pretty, fo pretty um, focused. And up here is probably the largest value, which is about a thousand, I think. Maybe it's not, maybe it's 300. It's, it's pretty large the number in a bin for magnitudes three, for, for some of these regions, but most of them are very small. So we, 
we took everything which had more than four quakes greater than 3.29. So here we are, we are where, um, where you have these two models, the recurrent neural net using LSTM, which I showed some of you, you will be using. In fact, I think one was using for the stock market. And I pointed out there's some pretty interesting analogies between stocks and earthquakes. As neither of them has a good physics model. And so um, in some sense, they're very empirical. And so both are, seem a good candidate for deep learning. And um, I'll have some remarks probably, we won't, may not get them today on, on uh, compute time. But these compute times vary from about four minutes per epoch to an hour per epoch. And that epoch runs over the 500 locations, uh, training and validation, and it runs over the uh, 1,788 sequences. So it's 500 times 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 that sequences, and every sequence has 13 members in it. So total number of entities is 500 by 1788 times 13. Um, but all of this can be run uh, on GPUs quite efficiently. And I say I haven't had a lot of trouble just running them on a single GPU. One thing that's extremely important is you have to shuffle whenever you, when you ever do anything, you shuffle immediately. You always randomize everything. And it's extremely important to randomize. Um, the default is to take the batch size to be the number of uh, training locations, uh, which is 400, but um, that is, that can be changed if you want. And in fact, there's some reason to believe it may not be the best best size. But something I like that is, a, is reasonable. One thing that is true is it's pretty important to have uh, batches of a certain size. If you reduce the batch size, you will find the compute time gets much bigger. And that's all due to a different uh, problem of, of computer systems. Um, these, um, Calculations are all vectorizable or, or runnable efficiently on GPUs or vector architectures. And um, if you would decrease the batch size, so you're doing fewer sequences at the same time, you will make the efficiency of the computation much lower. And so it's sort of interesting. I told you the epoch time varied from um, four minutes or three minutes to, to almost an hour. Well, um, that's doing the same number of, that, that, that time difference corresponds to the same number of floating point operations being done, but, but the small time is with a big vector and the larger time is with a smaller vector, about uh, a 20th of the size of the big vector. And so this is actually, these um, problems are a very good example of why we need to build vector architectures and that has, of course, been the basis of high performance computing, which is an area which I try to work in. And that's been true for a long time. And as we know, there are this huge amount of interest in AI accelerators, and they all have some nifty way of accelerating the performance. But just this simple, these simple problems here, they illustrate immediately why um, Vectorization and GPUs are very, are um, very important. In fact, there is, if you go to the web, there is um, a wonderful talk by Jensen Wang. Jensen Wang is the um, chief executive officer of NVIDIA. And NVIDIA just maybe it's probably finished by now, or so it's just nearing it's finished, is having their technology showcase. I think it's called GTC. And he gave a keynote on Monday. Yeah, Monday. And um, it was amazing how well they're doing. And of course, one reason Jensen Wang and NVIDIA is doing so well is the GPU is, is dominating deep learning. And Intel has really messed it up. They had a project which I even thought was had a chance of success with a so-called nice landing architecture, which was a 
which was a higher performance CPU, and it failed miserably. And so we have to, um, NVIDIA's success, which comes from deep learning, gaming, and Bitcoins, all of which use GPUs highly effectively. But you can see from this part of immediately why GPUs are good, because they effectively do for free all these separate computations because they're all done vectorized. So if you're doing one computation or doing the other ones automatically at the same time, and you need long enough vectors to make good use of these large GPUs. All right, so that's the side there. Um, the transformer is actually interesting. Even this explains why the transformer is practical. The transformer has far more computing in it than, <coughs> than um, the LSTM. In fact, because it go every every uh, computation goes like the square of the number of sequences in the computation, whereas um, LSTM is linear in the number of sequences. And as the number of sequences can uh, at least treat it together, which is what counts as 500, that looks as though it could take 500 times longer. But because it's running on the GPU and vectorizes, now there's even Intel CPUs vectorized somewhat, it, uh, it actually, the transformer execution time is similar to that for the recurrent neural net. And that's another very nice example of why vectorization is pretty interesting and important. Um, I say everything is done shuffled, everything is done in as big a vec as possible. Uh, we obviously should be able to use um, um, parallel implementations, which are, although they will have to increase this vector size even more to get good performance. Um, and one subtle thing is for inference, the, what I've been discussing here is training, which is when you don't find the network. Inference is when you find the results of the network. Well, the LSTM and transformer, what well, here says the transformer is 15% slower. They're comparable on training, but the LSTM is much faster on inference because the transformer has to do, when it does one computation, has to do all of them because it's comparing each point with all other points. Um, that's okay in training because you want to train on everything. So it's efficient. <coughs> you just do everything and then, um, and the, the, they're all added together into the loss function. But for an inference, you just want to know one value. At least often you only want to know one value. And then if you're sitting in Timbuktu, you'll want to know with the chance of an earthquake in Timbuktu, you'll just run that one location. <coughs> so for that case, you still have to run all the data. So transformer is hundreds of times slower on inference than um, LSTM. For earthquakes, it doesn't matter. Because earthquakes were not trying to find, I mean, because there are many time series, like the time series the robot, the self driving car gets, <coughs> you want to get results immediately. But you want to know now whether to take evasive action. For earthquakes, we want to know if there's an earthquake in the next few years. It doesn't matter if we have to run a few, I mean, well, they're not that long. If we have to run 10 minutes, calculate a large enough sample to get a result. So you have to fold in the nature of the problem. So transformers are challenging to use in some problems for this reason, but it doesn't matter for earthquakes. All right, so I already discussed um, uh, what data we use. And this is sort of non-trivial. And again, these comments here are valid for all time series point things. That's why I'm going through them. I'm going through the for earthquakes, this is a more complicated case, but the same issues occur for every time series, whether it be energy resources or the stock market. Um, so, and I've already pointed out why we need two things. We need properties and predictions. Properties are fed in and those feed through the, the, the networks and the predictions are what we train on. And for this class of data, properties and predictions effectively come from the same data sets. They're just different times or different manipulations of those data sets. 
All right, so now let's discuss what we can do for these two cases. Well, we have four types of data. Well, we have the first type is the seemingly the most important, and probably is the most important. It is the data from, in our case, the USGS, the, uh, which is the earthquake data, which I already explained we binned into first daily and then two week aggregations. Um, then we have static features. Now, <coughs> we also do an analysis of COVID um, infection and fatality data. There, the static features are very important. Those static features uh, correspond to the, the health quantities, where the number of elderly citizens in a region and the, percent, the percentage of high blood pressure people and things like that. And those static features affect the answer because COVID is dependent on that. And um, so several problems have important static features. Uh, in the case of the earthquakes, we don't really have that obviously important static features. I mentioned the fault label, that is a static feature. I'm not convinced it has any value. I have to analyze my results to see what happens when I leave them off. But my guess is I'll notice a little difference. All right, so we have, but uh, for other data samples like the hydrology data I looked at, it had 30 static features for every data point. And these hydrology was discussing the water structure at different regions in the US, uh, 650 regions roughly. And every region had 25 to 30 static properties like the height of the region, uh, the mean solar temperature of the region, the um, and uh, the uh, other measures like that, which were important for, which could be important for categorizing the behavior of um, that region when, when it rains and we get runoff and things like that, because that's what hydrology is studying, studying the amount of water and where it goes, given as input maybe the amount of rain. Now, so we have the data we input from the US Geological Survey we have the static features, which um, has to come from the medical community for COVID. And then we have another set of quantities, which is important, especially for the earthquake data, which are these calculated quantities. And um, I'm actually calculating a lot of quantities, um, but I mentioned already the time, the time, the most important, they're all time averages. And, uh, and the moment I go from a time average of one year in the past through four years in the future. So we have to calculate all those quantities. And then I go through you know, a nice stepped set of hierarchical things. Uh, two months, three months, six months, year, two years, four years. Um, and I mentioned I, don't, I only go use up to one year for the input, but up to four years for the output. Another thing I calculate is I come in with magnitudes because that's what's recorded for me on log energy. I then calculate these e to the quarter or e to the half and things like that. <coughs> so I can explore fits which have both magnitude and or energy, power of energy. Now something which I added, which may or may not be a good idea is mathematics. And I allowed my network to, to include simple time dependent functions. I started off <coughs> with constants and uh, uh, well, not kind of just linear functions because that was a natural label of the time index. But now I realized that probably it'd be good to have quadratic functions in time and cubic and so on. And I'll come back to that. Um, and I already explained this issue of having no missing data. All right, so here are the mathematical expansion functions. And we found two types of mathematical functions. The first is not so obviously useful for earthquakes, but it's certainly useful for COVID and hydrology. I already showed you in that COVID data is famous for having much less activity in the in the weekend compared to the uh, compared to a weekday, 
and that's due to the fact that what you, your COVID data is not the COVID data, it's the reported COVID data. And uh, there are far fewer uh, reported uh, cases and deaths in the weekend and even on Monday compared to the part of the week, Tuesday through Friday. And so I, I coped with that and got better answers in the description by allowing, carrying along with every, um, with every input um, quantity, cos, cos theta and sine theta, where cos theta and sine theta were defined for every day and just rotated from naught to two pi as you went from um, Sunday to Saturday or Monday to Sunday or whatever you want. Um, now for hydrology, weekly variation is not very important, but annual variation is important because you expect to come back to the same type of behavior every year. So for hydrology, I used annual, cos theta and sine theta again, where now theta went from naught to two pi over a year. So that's what I did there. So, um, but it's not totally, but so for this particular analysis, I decided the general, I didn't like weekly or, or annual for, um, for earthquakes. They don't seem to have much to do with earthquake science. So I just said, let's just do an ex, uh, a set of expansion functions. So I did uh, not to two pi over eight, 16, 32 and 64. And by the way, I wanted to stress this vectorization issue. I seem to be adding lots of properties, but it doesn't matter. These calculations are real fast. And as far as I know, they just compute like a bat out of hell. And so you can be very liberal in your properties because they will not impact the compute time very much. And so I didn't care. I mean, I only use the possibility of being useful, not the possibility of it minimizing compute time. Now, when I was a child, I always used the John polynomials for everything. That's what I used to get taught in the Cambridge University mathematical um, degree. So I decided to use the John polynomials as well. So P of one is of cos theta is cos theta. So we chose uh, for the Lagrange polynomials, we defined cos theta to be minus one at the beginning of time and plus one at the end of time. And we use P1, P2, P3, P4. And now these are what I call top down because these are functions which uh, are varying over a time period of several years. The cos theta sine theta for the, for the rapidly oscillating behavior, those are the small time or, or bottom up functions. So we had top down and bottom up and I chose e to the i theta with any cos theta and sine theta for the uh, bottom up and p of l for top down. And all of these functions are carefully normalized to lie between minus one and plus one. And so they're nice to use for a deep learning network. <clears throat> so we have lots of mathematical functions in our description. And here is actually the, um, so we have for every sequence, 24 predictions. The first 10 of those predictions, number zero through nine, are just the averages over log, uh, when I say magnitude, I really mean uh, log energy. Everything is always average, just log energy. And so we have 10 true predictions. And then I added all these magic, magic, ma possibly magic and possibly stupid mathematical functions. This is something anybody can try. Linear, I first had, I was actually I was originally motivated by these uh, people who do natural language processing and they use positional encoding to represent the position of a sentence in the, in the, in the document. So I replace that by a, by a property that's linear in space. That's just to label every, uh, every uh, sequence by space position, where it um, goes between um, naught and one as it goes from the, over the space points. We have this constant. Then we have the first the John polynomial, which is linear in time, P2, P3, P4. Then we have these, uh, 
cos 8 means cosine theta, we're going between naught and 2 pi over an eight week segment. And then we have, and say so we separate the, because I want e to the i theta, nice rotation. I do is cos theta and sine theta. I don't have the i, of course, I just use both of those. And so we have one, two, three, four, eight of these. So we have lots and lots of mathematical functions. As I'm not so, as I don't want them to have the same importance as the real data, you will, um, we give them lower weights. Now, if we come to the predictions, um, we have here, Rundle variable I added and the, sorry, this were the predictions. I'm, I should have said, I thought this was right. The predictions does not have the Rundle variables because the Rundle variables are rapidly varying and I don't want to predict rapidly varying functions because then I have this terrible uh, small value of mean over maximum problem, which I illustrated with e to the 0.25. So these are the predictions, the properties which are the ones inputted, they include the Rundle variable, the multiplicity and the depth. So they have three more there. Other, and they have, um, they do not have the um, four years. They just go out to a year. They have four, they have another four from these four different, these are the static variables, the four fault labelings, which correspond to different space filling curves. And then they have the same mathematical functions. Um, notice that I'm feeding in the math functions and predicting the math functions. Uh, whether that's a good idea, I'm not certain. I should say, if you look at the results, it always predicts the math functions much better than the data because the math functions are smooth. They don't have all these terrible variations. All right, so this is a good point to stop. To stop, so we will stop sharing now and ask if there are any questions. I'm, the purpose of doing this is to explain what it takes to be a data scientist and how you have to do all these different things and put it all together to get your results. Because although I described it for earthquakes, if you do it for um, stock market or, um, or consumer preferences, you'll have many of these same issues, all these normalizations issues, these mean values over maximum issues, they're all identical. The choice of properties and predictions the importance of uh, undefined variables. These are all the, these are all independent of the problem. That may or may not be as as important in different cases because, like we did not have nearly as many problems with um, with COVID example because our COVID data was very complete and we didn't really for COVID you don't want to predict five years in advance because that's the unrealistic. You just want to predict very short time in advance. So every problem has its own features which puts different weights on what I discussed, every slide I went through, but those slides have general value. All right, any questions? Yes, I did have a question on the material you covered last. How are these uh, mathematical expansion functions actually factored into, into the model itself? Um, I couldn't quite get how- so When you do the, let's take an LSTM. An LSTM is um, um, what you feed in for LSTM is for a, so you take a sequence and a predict, which is 13 time values. Every time value has a proper set of properties. Those mathematical functions go in as those properties. And those properties include the current value of log energy, the current, uh, and, or maybe the, value of log energy over the past year, but they also have cost these different values of cost theta. They're just properties. And that's also where you feed in the static variables. When we have the percentage of elderly patients, elderly people in, the, in a particular county, that's just a static variable. It's fed in the same way as the COVID case data. This, these particular approaches, and I think this is done universally in this area, you think of every data point, you just have a vector of input data associated with each time. And those input data are static, measured, or mathematical. Is that how I've done it? It's actually very poorly discussed in the literature. I've not seen 
a literature discussion, because I remember when Gregor and I started the COVID, we went suddenly out into the static variables. But everybody who's done this problem has done it in the way I just described, at least as far as I can see they have. And predictions are straightforward. You just have, you sum over any number of predictions. That's why you know, people start off thinking about, let's just predict the next time. You can predict four years in advance. You can predict any time of the world. And in fact, you can predict the, you know, the number of frogs born the following day from earthquakes if you wanted to. You can feed in any data you have. You the, 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 the poor old neural net doesn't know whether it's a sensible data point or not. All you need to have is a value called the prediction at this time, which can be fed in. You can put anything in. For the stock market, you can put in the weather, uh, whether you're feeling grumpy, um, or anything. Like in the case of um, the COVID data, we're going to add a variable, which is the um, percentage of people voting for Trump and Biden in the general election, because we expect that maybe COVID will be sensitive to the uh, party affiliation of the people, because people living in a dominantly Republican area may be less careful about, um, about social distancing. So that might even be a real thing to do. I won't have to see whether it makes any difference. But um, that's one exciting feature about uh, these neural nets. These neural nets are so general, they don't care what you feed in. Do anything you like. I think what is important is that there is a reasonably good, the dynamic range is good. You want to make certain you use that range from minus one to plus one really well. That's why these logs or taking parts of the data, I mean, and a lot of my, like in the COVID data, I took the square root of the counts. So the hydrology data, I took the cube root of one of the pieces of data to try to make that dynamic range better. That's where your, your high paid um, data science skills come in in choosing how to treat each data point. Because if you just feed in the data point, as is, I may not, I told you, if I was fed in the wrong data point for earthquakes, I would get really different answers. Any other questions? All right, folks, we'll see you next. Keep up, use good to GitHub and make Gregor happy. We don't need Gregor unhappy. Mm -hmm. And you need well, to get a great grade. We need everybody to get uh, yeah. great grades. We'll do. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Hey, Gregor, have you got anything on Pearl yet? Or Peach, what is his name? Pearl, I guess it is. <laughs>